Here we go. Perfect. Stay. Okay. Hmm? Yeah, pretty good. Some have been really good. Some of there's always a few things here. It's a little hard to get the documents that relate to the essay. All right, so we got an and I'll do a little bit more review. There's McClellan. He refused to do, refused to move. He would not use his powerful army. Lincoln, who made him the overall commander of all Union forces. Oh, what was the plan to slowly strangle the South, blockading it? Anaconda plan. Oh, any questions on the map we should do tomorrow? Oh, I have a, I have a question. And yeah, go ahead and get it on real quick. I forgot to ask. And I know there's a bunch of stuff in Virginia. That's just the way it is. But yeah. It's not like mobile, like the battle. Yeah, just it's just for Mobile, Alabama. Oh, okay. Yeah. It was a, one of the. Yeah. Then I couldn't find it. It's coming up with like cell phones. So. Okay, oh, you're in mobile. Oh, yeah. <laughs> the Battle of Mobile. And that, it was a naval battle. And did I get to this? You got this? Army of the Potomac? And I love that picture. He really does look three foot two now. And let's get real quick to the Eastern Theater. And the, you've got the Eastern Theater and the Western Theater, but the Eastern Theater is really just between Richmond and Washington, D.C. And it all has to be within walking distance. So it's all these fights are going to be right here. So in many ways, this area really is hollow ground for the United States. And then all in the west, it's not just the Mississippi River, which was considered the west. It goes all the way to Atlanta. It's still be calling the Western Theater, just the way it works out. And so here in many ways, the war would be decided. And Joseph E. Johnson was the commander of the Confederate forces. Davis hated Beauregard. He put Johnson, a great defensive commander, very intelligent, beloved by his men. Probably no general on either side was more loved by his men than Joseph Johnson, a Virginian, very confident, mid 50s. And Johnson's army was literally right here. He was entrenched just across the Potomac. In fact, they had trenches along the edge of the Potomac, they had trenches right there. And in fact, they were bristling with guns, looked like a very powerful defensive line. And to many people in Washington, D.C., it felt like a siege. It felt like the Confederates were on top of them. The Potomac is, or it could be navigated by ocean going vessels all the way up to Washington, D.C. Really wide. Then it turns into rapids, so you can't go much past. But ships couldn't use it because of the Confederate guns. And so, not just to destroy Johnson's army to win the war, but just politically, it looked really bad for the North to have the, the Confederates right there. And so McClellan had the enemy right there, but McClellan refused to attack. Lincoln was furious, begged him, pleaded with him, and McClellan was convinced that Johnston had between 150 and 200,000 troops. Therefore, that McClellan was outnumbered two to one. Now, Lincoln knew this was ridiculous for so many reasons, but the biggest one is, how many people did the North have compared to the South? Remember those numbers? How many did the North have? Over 21 million people. You remember how many people were in the South? Nine, but four million of them were slaves. That means maybe 1.5 billion total men, of, and some pretty old, of combat age to fight, there's no way the Confederates could outnumber them. But McClellan refused to believe. And part of the reason he was so deluded was he hired spies. He used intelligence to try to gather, you know, use intelligence espionage to gather information on Johnson's army. He hired private detectives, one of the first firms called the Pinkertons. And the Pinkertons, there's a Pinkerton right there, he had a detective agency, in fact, that would be their sign, we never sleep. They hired themselves as like private police. And out of this very creepy eye would become what slang term for private detectives? That's where private eye comes from, that eye right there. Wait, Johnson hired Pinkertons? McClellan. Oh, okay. And he was but and he went back to spy on Johnson's lawn. Now McClellan, he was in the army, graduated from the West Point, was in the Mexican War. After the war, 
he worked for the Illinois Central Railroad. In fact, he was one of the heads of it. And he hired Pinkertons to guard their trains. Also, the Pinkertons would be best known for breaking up labor unions. Workers would try to organize for better wages or conditions, and they'd use them as thugs, essentially. You know, the Pinkertons sold themselves as this professional police force, and they were just basically armed thugs. But McClellan thought they would go behind Confederate lines and spy. So these guys, and these are some of the Pinkertons, most of them were recruited around Chicago. So think about Chicago, and then coming down to Virginia to gather intelligence. You think they could hide very well? Hi, where's Johnson's army? How many men do the Confederates have? They stood out like a sore thumb. Now, they could have actually been executed for espionage. You spy, either disguised as a civilian or in... in the enemy's uniform, that is punishable by death, without a doubt. And the U.S. has done it on both sides. The U.S. spies have been killed. But instead, what did Johnston do? He heard about these Yehudes who were clueless going around Northern Virginia, and he fed them fake information. We're getting 10,000 troops every day. We have so many men we don't know what to do with. And in fact, we're just waiting to attack and take Washington, D.C. Okay? I don't know. You don't know? Yeah. Let me know. She just told me to sit. <laughs> I understand. Yeah, let me know, okay? So with that, and McClellan, they went back and told McClellan, there's 200,000 Confederates. And what did McClellan do? How did McClellan react to this? I knew it. I knew I was outnumbered. I'm a genius for hiring the Pinkertons. And they kept feeding this loop of bad information. He said, I knew they had 150,000. So the Pinkertons would go back out and come back. They have 200,000. I knew they have 200,000. And Lincoln refused, or Lincoln was just furious. And McClellan began to think Lincoln was a moron. Don't you understand that my army is the only thing that saves the Union? And you want me to blow it up? And so finally, don't worry about this. I'm not going to talk about the Shenandoah Valley. Here, Stonewall Jackson become famous at everything. Yeah. But before anything big could happen, at the end of February, Johnston pulled back here for a very good reason. They pretty much scraped every bit of food they could from Northern Virginia. He was out of supplies completely, totally out of supplies. They pulled back to here. And McClellan's forces made a big deal of taking the Union or the Confederate lines. Those trenches all the way along the Potomac that were bristling with, bristling with guns and booby traps and all this stuff. And when they took it, here's what Northern reporters took pictures of. Those are the Confederate lines, and those are the guns bristling out of the fortifications. Do you see them? <laughs> They're logs. They have logs painted black that look like cannons. To fool the Union forces. In fact, here is a Union soldier acting like he's lighting a fake camera for the cameras. In fact, they call them Quaker guns. Because Quakers are what? Pacifists. Now, if you saw this, the Confederate line with nothing but fake guns, what would it tell you, a relatively rational thinking person, about the Confederates? That they're what? Yeah, they're weak, right? What did McClellan think? They have, man, they're so smart. They have more than I think. And they're trying to suck me into a premature attack to destroy my army. In fact, Lincoln had enough. Lincoln actually fired him from the head of all Union forces and said, just command the Army of the Potomac, please. Just command them. And in fact, uh, Lincoln would take over command of all forces, which was a terrible mistake. He had no idea what he was doing. McClellan, though, did have a plan. With Johnston pulling back to here, McClellan used the now powerful U.S. fleet, and his plan was to take 80,000 men and land here. The U.S. saw a fort on the James Peninsula. Remember General Butler we saw in the video? And slaves began to run away to the Union lines, and he said they should be kept because they're helping the Confederate Army. Slaves are helping the Confederate war effort, so 
runaway slaves should be sheltered behind union lines. That's where Butler was, right? Here. What did they call runaway slaves? Do you remember? Contraband. Yeah, contrabands. So his plan was to take 80,000 troops, land here, march quickly, get in between Richmond and Johnston, fight a battle right here, destroy Johnston's army, and with the most important Confederate army destroyed, the U.S. could win right there. Now, this would be huge, but think about the complications of this. Vicious slavery would not have been resolved. This is one of the great what ifs in history. And so in March, he did. It's called the Peninsula Campaign, where they landed right there. The Peninsula Campaign. But before we get to that, one of the most important naval battles in history would take place right it's called the off the hampton case and it's called we always call it out to the two ships the merrimack and the monitor that's what's called the virginia but we go with the merrimack and this would be a radical naval battle that would forever change the course of history and show how the world had so totally changed i'll come back to this in just one second right here union ships are right here and the Confederates had what they thought was a surprise. When Union forces evacuated the naval base at Norfolk, Virginia, they tried to burn a ship called the Merrimack. So they burnt this ship, but it was half finished. The hull sunk, but put out the fire. The Confederates brought the hull up of this big ship, and what they did is they stuck iron plates on it, and they made so if the ships like this, they made them kind of like an angle. So if cannonballs hit it, they would ricochet off. And this would be the first clash of, and do get this down, ironclads. Ironclads. Literally meant clad with iron armor. Now, in the Industrial Revolution, you think, why did they have ironclads earlier? Well, the reason why is simple. The engines weren't strong enough, so they thought the ship would just sink. But the Confederates rolled the die. So they had cannon on both sides. In fact, they came out and sunk two Union ships in less than a half hour. And it looked like this could turn the entire course of, of the war. One ship. But Union spies knew about it, and they'd been working on their own ironclad called the Monitor. And this was a radically different ship. Its deck is just above the surface of the water, and on it has a rotating turret. The turret has two cannons that could spin 360 degrees. So it could fire in any direction. Now, both of them moved slow. They were underpowered. The crews on both ships were, um, they just about died of carbon monoxide poisoning. And they were kind of disastrous ships in a lot of ways. But black power, black powder cannon, the shells just bounced right off. Did nothing. They fought one battle during the day. It was pretty much inconclusive. They tried to ram each other. They couldn't knock each other out. The Merrimack limped back into harbor because the engine was so bad and actually never came back out again. So technically, the Monitor won. But this would radically change everything. In fact, this would show how industry, industry has changed the entire world. And this is what we got to get. This battle showed that the most important thing in battle is industry and technology. The most important thing in war, this, this battle proved it industry and technology. It didn't matter how brave the sailors were on the wooden steam powered ships, they had no way to fight against these new ironclads. That meant that every ship and every navy was obsolete, regardless of how skilled a seaman they were, or how or how brave the sailors were. Technology and industry. If you can make more and have the advanced technology, the odds are you will win in war. And it will give you a massive competitive advantage over every other single power in the world. The British were working on ironclads, but this convinced them we better start making them now. And every other ship and every other navy was, was obsolete. What is that term for business and economics? That the bigger the company, it has a competitive advantage over smaller. Economies of scale and it works for the military too. If your country has the technology, if your country has the industry, you have a huge advantage in Huge. That becomes more important than tactics. That becomes more important than bravery. It becomes technology 
it becomes industrial. And who can produce more the fastest wins? This is revolutionary. That means wars are not just about battlefields. Wars are about factories, resources, fuel. And what do soldiers become? If the war is about industry and factories, what are soldiers? A lot. Huh? In a way, yeah. In fact, World War One, they would just call them numbers. Right, do we have enough numbers to survive after our technology has killed all of them, most of them? Whoever can kill the most wins. People think war is about bravery. It's about technology. And the U.S. has been living on this technological advantage since here. Bigger and more technological advantage. And we're still there, even though our advantage is going away industrially really fast. But we still have that advantage because of this. That means every other country, no matter how brave they are, they have no chance. It's no coincidence that the second half of the of the 19th century, that's when Western Europe industrial advanced, the US, and then Japan would do a race industrialization, would conquer most of the rest of the world. Every other country is weaker. And here's the other thing. If one country has a competitive advantage and they're winning, their advantage gets bigger over time. It grows. Argentina was one of the wealthiest countries in the world at the turn of the century, but they didn't have the industry. It's a classic example. So with this, ironically, the war, the battle would be a draw. By the way, the monitor, they tried to send it down to Charleston for blockade duty. Anybody want to guess what happened to the monitor by looking at the deck? The wave went over it. Yeah, got caught in the storm. One big wave, and it was gone. So there's some flaws with the monitor's design. But this is the first modern warship, right? Here, the monitor. So with that, McClellan soon, by the middle of March, had over 80,000 troops here. And all he had to do was move quickly up here, and he could win that battle. Instead, what did he do? It took him nearly three weeks to move five or ten miles. <laughs> he refused to go. He's McClellan. He was convinced he's outnumbered. He got to this very elaborate entrenchment dug by slaves. Between Yorktown, remember Jamestown, the first colony? This is all a historic park. In fact, you go there today, it's part of the National Park. Yorktown, the last battle of the Revolutionary War, all along this trench line is still there, and then the first colony, Jamestown. It's all still here. If you get a chance, go. It's really cool. But he got to there, and he thought there were 150,000 troops in this small little peninsula. How would he ever get around? He didn't know that Johnston is still up here. Johnston thought this was a diversion and not the real attack. If he would have moved fast, they could have very well won the war. In fact, he got here, and there were less than 8,000 Confederate forces against 80,000. And what did McClellan do? He waited and pulled up reinforcements. The Confederate commander, a general by the name of Magruder, not a great commander, but he pulled off a great trick. He had his men act like they had tens of thousands of men. So they're deep nine-foot trenches. So they couldn't see the men. So they had men yelling orders to fake units. He'd have men purposely captured. So they would tell him, oh, yeah, we just got 10,000 reinforcements. And McClellan bought every word. In your town, they had a locomotive pull up. The Confederates did. Pull up. Billow out steam like a train is arriving. And then had its men yell out. They had men yell out fake orders to fake regiments getting off of a fake train. And the Union bought it completely. In fact, then they would back up about half a mile, wait 15 minutes, and then do it again. It worked completely. My favorite is this is my drawing of it. It has one man holding a pole. It had a plank across it. And then they nailed old muskets with bayonets. You get what they would do then? So they would carry them in the trenches. So all you'd see the top of the bayonets. And they just kind of walk like this. And turn and walk like that. And McClellan bought it completely. He waited weeks. This could have ended the war right there. In fact, they brought these big, heavy siege mortars, and they had to use a cement foundation over wood. So it took them a week just to make that. They would lob shells like that. Here is from Yorktown trenches. They call it the Siege of Yorktown. These are Union soldiers playing poker because they're not doing anything, anything else, waiting to finally attack. And just before the Union Army attacked, 
the Confederates pulled back a mile and they did it all over again for another week. In that week, finally, Johnston came down. McClellan blew a huge opportunity. But, oh, what made it even worse is McClellan tried to use aerial reconnaissance. They had a hot air balloon called the Intrepid. The first time in war, they were going to use a balloon to get over the Confederate line and see where they were lined up. This is actually a really good idea. You can see all these pictures of battles in with a balloon. But they only did it a few times because I think you see the problem with the balloon. Couldn't go very high. Yeah, one shot and it goes down very fast. It lands quickly. And the other problem is they go up any kind of wind and then just be gone. They had no control over it. It was a great idea. It wasn't time. They actually abandoned it too soon. But it still almost worked. When the Confederates finally began to pull back this way, Johnston didn't give battle. And in fact, he went to trenches that were already dug by slaves around Richmond. And the Union Army formed around it. And it looked like by the end of May, the war is about over. Still, despite all the blown opportunities, there's a chance. Johnston would counterattack right here, what's called the Battle of Fair Oaks or Seven Pines. A really confusing battle. There were over 150,000 troops fought in this battle. Men got lost, units got mixed together. In some areas, there were units firing in each other's faces less than 20 yards apart. The casualties were appalling. The only reason they weren't worse is because so many men got lost and got bad orders. And remember, they still fought. I talked about this for the Revolutionary War. The basic idea was still to line up across from each other about 50 yards and blaze away. The problem was weapons at this time already had a range of 150 yards. They were fighting like they had old weapons at a range of 50 yards. Casualties were unreal. You see the picture? To the balloon. And there's all these pictures from this area. They draw the balloon up, even though by then it wasn't even working. I just think it's really funny. Now, what's a casualty? Casualty in war is somebody who's killed, wounded, or missing. It's somebody who can no longer fight. Missing almost always means they're captured. Now, if you gear casualty number, a lot of times people just think it's people, people who were killed. No, people can't fight anymore. And there were over almost 12,000 casualties in this battle on both sides. Well over 6,000 were Union. You okay? You got to go? Yeah, my mom's excusing me, so I might get to go, do you think? Hmm? My mom's excusing me. I'll let you go, yeah. Okay, thank you. Hopefully it's not a concussion or not. Uh, yeah, I'm going to the doctor later, so we'll see. Good luck. <laughs> and no, I forgot I'm concussed. <laughs> I've been concussed. It's not fun. Of course, when I, 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 I just tell them, this is not like in my day. When I, in my day, we were, no, actually it was. Like, it just head, not a big deal. It's actually kind of a good thing that they actually kind of care about such things as your head. I forgot four days once. Okay, with that. <laughs> huh? Okay, you know how you said that Johnson was in that one area and then he totally ran out of supplies? Yeah. Does that like totally ruin the town that he was in too? Oh yeah, they took everything. Because like the townspeople don't have food anymore? Yep. Okay. Northern Virginia would just be destroyed in this war. And then like every, like just think about just like split rail, split rail fences or, or picket fences were on houses and they take all the wood from fires. So they're just, they take everything. Oh, is that like legal? Okay. Ready to do it. Yeah, so with that, one of the wounded in this battle was Johnston. Johnston took a musket ball. There, a, a French engineer made a new musket ball. His name was Albert Manet. So Americans called him mini balls. You know Manet. He took this musket ball right here, right hip, lodged in the bone. He lived, but he would be bedridden for six weeks, six six months, I'm sorry. And in fact, he would die in 1889. For the rest of his life, using the terminology of the day, it would leak. 
Yeah. Mm. Blood and palace and everything. Yeah, it was just horrible wound. We're not done with Johnston yet, but Davis is somebody that actually nobody in the Confederate Army wanted Robert E. Lee to take command. Nobody wanted him. They thought he was too old. When he got the job, the men around Richmond, the Confederate soldiers, called him Old Granny Lee. They thought he was too old and not tough enough, especially when you have them build trench or dig trenches. He renamed the soldiers around Richmond as the Army of Northern Virginia. And that's where you get the Army of the Potomac, you get the Army of Northern Virginia. And this is, these are two really good pictures because there's no uniforms. You might have heard, you know, the blue and the gray. Confederates didn't have enough fabric to make flags. They didn't have enough textiles to make uniforms. They have whatever clothes they have. Mostly they're brown. Sometimes they're called butternuts because they were dyed from the butternut tree. I love this picture because you just see them wearing like, whatever clothes they have. I love the officer. He has a suit on, and then he put on the epitaph, the uh, insignia of his rank right there. I think that's hilarious, but also shows it's all they have. So this, this kind of showed the end of this last little bit of pre-industrial fighting versus industrial fighting, where you can still win a war even though without any industrialization. It's ending, as seen by the Merrimack and Monitor. And Lee did the only thing he knew what to do, up number two to one with the capital to his back. Literally at the gates of Richmond, he attacks. Less than a month after he took command, in a series of battles we lumped together as seven days, Lee counterattacked McClellan's army. McClellan's army formed like a semicircle right here, over 110,000 men by then. Lee attacked this flank right here. You know, I just need to know the seven days. And actually, a lot of the same problems that Seven Pines happened here. And the Union army not only repulsed them, counterattacked. By the end of the day, the soldiers on the field, especially generals like Phil Kearney, Union generals, that was a Union victory. But what did McClellan see it as? We barely saved the army. Only my brilliance saved the army. I am so outnumbered that they nearly destroyed me. To McClellan, this proved all, his, all, the, all of his fears. And what did McClellan do? He retreated. After a victory, McClellan retreated. So what did Lee do? Attack again. Same result. McClellan retreated again. In fact, McClellan retreated so fast he nearly lost his whole army right here at Frazier's Farm. The last battle of the Seven Days was a huge Union victory. And yet McClellan retreated and ran away all the way to the James River. In seven days, the entire course of the war turned. It went from the war is almost over to humiliating defeat, it might never end. Maybe we ought to pull out of this thing, Northern or Southern saying, literally just seven days. The entire course of history changed. Sure, gone, but should we call her back? So with that, at Malvern Hill, Confederates made almost a suicidal charge up the hill and you remember I told you about grape shot and then another weapon they started using in the Mexican War, where they fire about 200, 250 musket balls, which is fire out. Remember I told you about that? Do you remember the name of that? Canister. Confederates charged into Union can and fired canisters in their faces, sometimes as close as 20 yards, and the canister ripped bodies apart. There were just heaps of bodies at Malvern Hill, and McClellan still retreated. He ran away after victories. Seven days of fighting. Get the cash. I mean, just you don't need to know the exact number. I mean, I'm just trying to give you an idea how many people are dying. The casualties in seven days for both the North and the South over 37,000. 20, 21,000 of them were competitive. Whoever attacks always gets more casualties. Do you get an idea how bloody it is? So you don't need to know the numbers. The point is I'm just trying to get you the idea of how many people are dying or being ripped apart by this. McClellan retreated to this place called Harris's Landing and just stayed. 
Overnight, it went from McClellan now reporting the war is almost over. In fact, Lincoln went down here to beg McClellan. Just imagine, imagine the president, the commander in chief of the armed forces in time of war, according to the Constitution, begging a general to do something. In fact, when Lincoln got down to Harrison's Landing here, McClellan proceeded to lecture Lincoln on how bad of a president Lincoln was and said that maybe the country needs a dictator. Which, of course, by, to McClellan's point of view, would be whom? So Lincoln, in fact, this is where Lincoln made his famous statement, if you're not going to use your army, can I borrow it? Lincoln started slowly pulling troops out of Harrison's land because he was scared to remove McClellan. Isn't that amazing? Being scared to remove a general who disobeys orders? A very similar thing happened during the Korean War. With a general by the name of MacArthur and President Truman. There was a real fear that McClellan would just take his army. We still lost him. Because they are told that McClellan saved you and go up to Washington, D.C. and make McClellan dictator. There was a real fear of that. Lincoln began to take the army away and give it to another general who won a small victory in the, in the West on the Mississippi named General John Pope. And Pope, a short term little army called Army of Virginia. So they took, slowly but surely, took troops away from McClellan found other troops in other battlefields, and Pope would soon have about 70,000 men. What general is he copying? Oh. Yeah, that's the Napoleonic pose. And here, now, Pope, who said, I will destroy the state of Virginia, I'll kill every rebel, Lee would call him a miscreant, but we're coming to the next battle. The second bull run. At the end of August of 1862, the end of August, and this lithograph seems to show a big Union victory. No, it was a disaster. Polk stumbled into Northern Virginia, was outflanked, outmaneuvered, and nearly lost his whole army. Another humiliating defeat. In fact, I'll do the very easy version. See my mouse? Here's the McClellan, right here. He still has about 50,000 men. Pope is advancing this way, along the railroad tracks. Lee figures McClellan doing nothing. He leaves him. Stonewall Jackson takes half of Lee's army, marches behind Pope, and entrenches on the Bull Run battlefield. Pope turns to fight him, and Lee hits him with the rest of his army in Pope's rear. It was a disaster. And this is easy to follow map should tell you everything you need. Okay, there's problems with this map, but it does have arrows. So with that, that's after a battle of Manassas, that's a bull run. Another humiliating Union victory. And the army is not decimated, but they limp back to Washington, D.C. That's a Union victory? Yeah. Another humiliating Confederate victory. Humiliating for the Union. In fact, I'm trying to give you an idea how bloody it is. In two days now, two days. 27,000 down. 17,000 of them are human. In two days! That's 10,000 less than the seven days, and it's five days fewer battle. This is unreal how bloody it's getting. And you figure about a quarter of those died. And many of those men could never fight again, have to be cared for. This is horrific carnage. And this is becoming a crisis. The, the Union had lost over 100,000 men in the summer. Just in the West, I mean, or the East. That's not even counting the West and other battles. But Lee's in pretty rough shape, too. Oh, I should add, Polk, he's fired. He'd never be seen again. Actually, he went to Minnesota to fight the Yankton Sioux. So, Lee's now in Northern Virginia. Remember we mentioned, remember we mentioned that Northern Virginia just stripped of food? Yeah. He's up there. He has now less than 40,000 men. Half of them don't have shoes. They've worn through them. Low on supplies. And what does he do? Low on supplies, low on equipment, without shoes, no uniforms. Lee only knows one thing to do. 
invade. Oh, almost forgot the story. Bill Carney was maybe the best Union general. Could have been the best of the war. Graduated from West Point. A lot of officers did this. For a while, he fought with the French Army. Lost an arm fighting in Tunisia. But at Bull Run, he tried to get Polk to attack, just like he tried to do it at the Seven Days, to get McClellan to attack. And he rode out to find the Confederate line, hoping that Polk would turn around and counterattack. When he was riding back, this was up to September 1st, 1862, riding back towards the Union lines, Union pickets, which are guards, saw shadowy figures coming at them on horseback in the middle of the night. And what did they do? He was killed by his own men. And this happens a lot in the war, but this will be foreshadowing to what's going to happen to a famous Confederate general. Here's actually a statue at Arlington Cemetery. It's another one of the what ifs. But Lee invades the North. So back to this. Lee invades. This is a drawing and then crossing the Potomac. And the reason why is this he knows he's outnumbered, but if he can win one big victory in the North, that might get what country into the war, just like the Battle of Saratoga. Saratoga, the Revolutionary War, brought what country into the war? In the Revolutionary War? France. Who might a victory in? in let's, he was hoping to get into Pennsylvania. Who might enter the war? Britain. So he's going to roll the die, thinking he could win a victory. Remember I told you about they never really committed to holding out? This is what I mean. If they're caught north of the Potomac, his army could be destroyed and the whole war is over. But Lincoln is getting incredibly worried. Lincoln is beginning to realize that the Union might not be enough. They've had so many casualties. The war was going against them. They're going to have a midterm election in 1862. Lincoln is worried that the North might give up. We need to widen the war to make it something or give it a cause worth fighting for. Union won't be enough. What else? He begins talking about limited freeing of slaves. The problem is this. If he offers to free the slaves after two horrible defeats, what does he look? What does he look like? I've lost these two terrible battles. Oh, yeah, but I'll free the slaves. He looks what? The country looks what? Weak and desperate. He needs a what? He needs a victory. The British invaded the North. I'm sorry, the the Confederates invaded the North to get the British into the fight. Lincoln needs a victory. This is him playing poker with Jefferson Davis. And that will be his one last card, one last Trump card. A pretty, it's a good cartoon, but it's from Britain. It's also incredibly racist. If you look at the stretch of black face on this card. Last effort. This is coming to one of the most important battles in history. And Lincoln knows it. As troops begin to gather on Washington, D.C., wait, wait. Who does he put in command? McClellan. He's got no choice for the most important battle in history. It really is. By the way, anybody know what that battle is? The Battle of Antietam. The bloodiest day in American history. It's coming. Goodbye, everybody. Write when you find work, and I would argue hang by your thumbs.